Welcome back, back with another banger, it's the React Files, where we react to the creepiest, craziest, scariest TikToks, share watch along. Hope you're having a good night, if you haven't already, please take a second just to smash that like, subscribe, ring that notification bell, just to make sure algorithm knows what's up. So let's get straight to it. The Heart Island Insane Asylum concealed by misty Hudson River fog in the early 1900s, bore witness to inexplicable occurrences that spawned chilling ghost stories. Whispers of tormented spirits and spectral sightings persisted long after the asylum's doors were permanently sealed, leaving the island with an enduring reputation as a haunted and forsaken place. I think that was the creepiest AI I've ever seen to date. The Valentine's Day Massacre happened on February 14, 1349, when over 2,000 Jews were burned alive in the French city of Strasbourg. The reason for the mass killing was the bubonic plague, which was then sweeping Europe and killing millions. Despite Jews also getting the disease and dying at rates comparable to their non-Jewish neighbors, they were blamed for it anyway, and accused of poisoning the wells. In Strasbourg, a mob overthrew the local government and arrested Jews accused of causing the plague. On Saturday morning, February 14th, about 2,000 Jews, anyone who refused to convert to Christianity and thus earn amnesty, were bound to a wooden structure and slowly burned alive. After the fire, the locals picked through the charred bodies for valuables. All debts owed to Jews were cancelled on that day as well. Strasbourg's mob government and citizens faced no criticism for the atrocity, and a few months later, Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV pardoned them for killing their town's Jews and for stealing their money. Dang, man. There's so many massacres that happen on the 14th. 1349. The bubonic plague was around. That's crazy. <laughs> I don't know what that was. It looked like somebody's lunch to me. Here are the surprisingly dark origins of Valentine's Day. In one story, St. Valentine was actually a priest known by the name of Valentinus. He was executed for helping Christians escape the torturous Roman prison systems. While imprisoned, Valentinus fell in love with a girl and sent her a love letter signed from your Valentine. Another rendition tells of Valentinus disobeying Emperor Claudius II. Claudius believed that single men made better soldiers so he outlawed marriage, but Valentinus, dedicated to love, continued to marry off couples, defying the law, resulting in his execution. Some say that Valentine's Day is actually a Christian replacement for the pagan feast of Lupercalia, which consisted of men sacrificing animals, then using the skins to whip pregnant women. Maybe it goes unsaid, but Henry VIII is the king who declared Valentine's Day a national holiday for England, even though he had two of his six wives executed. In another story, Valentinus performs a miracle which enables a young blind girl to see again. When the emperor hears of this miracle, he orders the execution of Valentinus, the girl, and the girl's entire family. Those with some real creepy origins for Valentine's Day. Like, which one was it? There's so many renditions. What you will see here is the etheric energy blueprint behind an object. Even though a section have been cut off, the energy body is still present. This is why when people lose their limbs, they can still feel it present. Because the etheric body can never be broken. This proves that we are not the body. You are the spirit inside of the body. If you don't believe me, you can literally do this exercise yourself to activate your bodies. This is called astral projection. It's using your mind to project your consciousness into the astral plane, the realm of imagination. This was talked about in the Bible when Jesus walks on water. It's a metaphor for astral projection. The water is the ether, the barrier between the physical and the spiritual planes. Before you do this, you need to make sure you're in a good, high vibrational mindset. Whatever frequency you are vibrating on, you will match within the astral planes. For example, if you are vibrating very low, you will meet beings, entities that are vibrating very low. This is what we call demons. Since you are in the right mindset, you need to lie down flat with no body parts touching. Rest every single muscle and be still as possible. Close your eyes, breathe deeply in through the nose and out through the mouth. Focus your attention on the center of the brain, the place of the consciousness. You need to do this for at least 10 to 15 minutes until you are just left with an empty mind. Now you want to use your mind to imagine yourself pulling a rope up into the sky. 
Imagine yourself floating above your body. One thing that you must never do if you do successfully astral project is never look into the mirrors. Yeah, that's crazy. I wouldn't suggest trying to do that, but like he said, if you do, don't look into the mirrors. Valentine's Day, a day of love, chocolates, and roses. But what if I told you that the origins of this holiday are much darker than you think? Valentine's Day has its roots in the pagan festival of Lupercalia, a time of animal sacrifice, violent rituals, and wild orgies. But even more disturbing is the story of Saint Valentine, an innocent priest who was executed for his beliefs. His story was co-opted by the church to create the Valentine's Day we know today. And now, this holiday is nothing more than a marketing ploy to boost sales and consumerism to distract us from the darker origins of this day. So, as you celebrate Valentine's Day, remember its dark past and the commercialization that it has become. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, it's definitely commercialized these days. I didn't know it had such dark pagan roots. If you come to this bridge in Sefton Park at 11.15pm on Valentine's night, it's said that you'll see a ghost of a couple walking hand in hand. This story takes us right back to 1873 when the bridge was built. The bridge was a popular meeting point for courting couples. Oliver was a young man from an upper class family. He was in a relationship with a young lady called Kathleen who was from a middle class family. They were deeply in love but Oliver was being forced by his family into an arranged marriage. Oliver told Kathleen this devastating news as they stood on the bridge on Valentine's night. He begged Kathleen to meet him at 11pm in exactly one year's time on the bridge. Exactly a year passed and at 11pm Oliver arrived at the bridge. True to his word he waited and waited and waited. At 11.15pm he noticed Kathleen at the end of the bridge. He ran up to her to greet her but she just passed through his body. He learnt that Kathleen had died that very night of cholera disease at precisely 11.15pm. He later learned from her family that her dying words were I must meet my true love at the bridge at Sefton Park. And now every Valentine's night at 11.15pm, Oliver and Kathleen appear walking across the bridge hand in hand. Every Valentine's night at 11.15pm you'll see people gather on the bridge in hope to see the spirits glide across. I suppose the moral of the story is that even in death, love never dies. As recently as 2023, a park ranger saw an outdated looking woman standing on the bridge. Then, as she crossed the bridge, she seemed to vanish into thin air. If you head to the river that's located underneath the bridge, you can read the entire heartbreaking story that's located on a plaque. Would you come here on Valentine's night? Yeah, that's a great question. To be honest, if I was on that side of town, it was about 11 o'clock, I'd go check it out. For sure. I definitely had a camera with me. You know what I mean? That would definitely be a viral moment. That was caught on camera. So this is in Liverpool. Anyone else ever heard of this? Let me know in the comments down below. Cruise and oil. This is the Freemasons. This is uh, Hindu. This is your spine and that's Egyptian. That's right. Because guess what? It's called Santa Claus when he comes down the chimney and gives a gift to us. This is the Santa Claustrum. It's in your brain and it comes down and it gives a gift to us and it goes back up. So this is why Jesus dies at 33 years old because it goes down your spine and back up. The Christos or the golden oil. In Greek, Christos means gold. So the claustrum is up here. Santa goes down the chimney. That's because Jesus was in Nazareth with his mama. And then King Herod wants to kill Jesus. So Jesus must go all the way down to be born in Bethlehem. Then he goes back up. See, he's going down this river and back up, down the spine and back up. So this is Kemet in Egypt. This is the Jordan River. So the Jordan River is a little tiny replica of this because this was the lotus flower or your spine. So this represents your spine. If we know that this did represent your spine, which it did, then undoubtedly the Jordan River represented the spine just like the Nile River. This is for you ignorant churchgoers, I swear. Candy cane is red for uh, feminine, white for masculine. It's the, mes it's, the, it's the two nerves, the Ida and the Pingala, the sun and the moon. So the Pingala is the pineal gland, that's the Ida. That's the pituitary, the negative component, and the pineal gland, the positive component. So you have the milk and, or the milk and honey, the gold and silver. This is the promised land. So when, uh, what's his name? Jack climbs the beanstalk. He goes up his spine and finds the golden egg in the gray clouds, which is the gray matter in your brain. 
Well, look, St. Nicholas is St. naga list. Naga means serpent. That's why when Thor takes the Bifrost Bridge, this is your thorax, which is 12 vertebrae. There's 12 vertebrae of your thorax, thoracic vertebrae, and there's 12 ribs on each side, 24 ribs. So there's Arthur and the 12 knights at the round table, your 12 vertebrae. Jesus and his 12 disciples. Thor takes the rainbow bridge, which is your chakras, your spine. Arthur is the only one who can lift the sword. Thor is the only one who can lift the hammer because you have to be worthy. Raise your frequency to go up. Pituitary gland, pineal gland, and your optic thalamus. So the energy goes down from your claustrum, the oil at least, the oil goes down the vagus nerve to the sacrum bone where it pumps it back up and it actually activates your third eye and it illuminates the crown chakra. This is the Pingala and the Ida and they mix and they come back up and your skull is the holy grail and that's why it's the elixir of life, the fountain of youth because your skull is called a fontanelle, that little hole at the top of all of babies' heads. It's, called, it's literally called a fontanelle at the top of the head because it's the fountain. So the energy goes from the bottom to the top and the, the snake grows its wings. Yeah, he's spinning that same game like Revival of Wisdom. But yeah, chrism oil. Man, there's some interesting stuff right here. Stick around if you want me to blow your mind. Hue man. Hue means an attribute of a color. Color is light. We are light manifested into physical form. If you know anything about electromagnetism, you know these mini torus fields create reality. They are the true atoms. Each torus field is one unit of light. So then you go to Genesis and look at what the first thing ever created was. Let there be light. Genesis 1.3. John 1.5. God is light. So this means atoms are one unit of light and these atoms create everything. This means everything is God. You are God and everything you see around you is God. We live inside of the mind of God. So God, Allah and Elohim all add up to 26 or 62. Add that together, that is eight. Symbol for the eight comes from the Taurus field. Everything is infinite, everything is light and everything is God. There is no God outside of you. We need to stop worshipping these false humanistic gods within religion. And we all need to manifest the God mind because we are all God. And this is why the Bible says, ye are gods. You are all sons of the most high. We are microcosms of the macrocosm. So with red light therapy, you want to do incandescent or a halogen bulb. You can find those on 1000bulbs.com. They have some on there and they're you know, cute little red bulbs. They're like little Christmas bulbs, I believe they are. But you can get that, and that would be the simple way of getting the red light color spectrum that you may be missing. The problem with the LED is like we were talking about, it emits radio frequencies, has a high flicker, and then also is digitally creating the color red. So you're not really getting the red color spectrum. Incandescents have more of the red color spectrum in them naturally. That's why it's important to get, if you want an infrared bulb or towards that, that spectrum, you want to aim for things that are under the incandescent because they have a more red spectrum naturally. LEDs, none. It's digital light and the waves just mess with your mind. Go into Target or a grocery store and sit there for about an hour and those lights are going to start messing with your mind. You start getting dizzy, nauseous, you know, just not feeling yourself. If you think about red light therapy with LEDs, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's quite the opposite of health promoting. Yeah, that's my first time really hearing about these red light therapy. You know, so I'm catching up on the whole subject. Let me know in the comments down below if you've done red light therapy before. Tell me how it went. If you go to Australia or certain parts of England and you say the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, the last thing that pops into their head is Chicago. Uh, on February 14th, 1942, began the beginning of the fall of Singapore. He took over the British military hospital, Alexandra Hospital, and the Japanese slaughtered three to four hundred people. While the soldiers lay recouping in their bed, they bayoneted them, they bayoneted them on surgery, on table, operating tables. The rest of the people in the hospital, they took POW. A lot of the doctors were beheaded. So when you say St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Australia, it probably has a completely different meaning and a lot of the veterans it's families shits about <laughs> give two shits about seven gangsters dying in Clark Street. Hey, 300 people is a lot to get slaughtered like that. 
on Valentine's Day in 1942. My golly, bro. Talk about savage. The Valentine's Day Massacre occurred on February 14, 1929, in Lincoln Park, Chicago, during the Prohibition. Four of Al Capone's men entered a garage, which was the main liquor headquarters of bootlegger George Morin's North Side Gang. They fired more than 150 bullets into the victims, ending their lives. The garage has been knocked down since, but the building that stands there now reports paranormal happenings, such as sounds of shots and moaning. The bricks that were repurposed from the garage are also said to be cursed, with multiple paranormal accounts surrounding them. A cold-blooded massacre cast a long shadow over Chicago's north side on February 14, 1929. Seven men, primarily linked to George Bugs Moran's Irish gang, were ruthlessly gunned down by Al Capone's Chicago outfit. Fueled by greed and the thirst for power, this act of brutality was a direct consequence of the illegal liquor trade running rampant during Prohibition. The horrifying scene unfolded with four gunmen, two disguised in police uniforms, tricking the victims into a garage. Unaware of their impending fate, they were lined up against the wall and mercilessly shot down with shotguns and Tommy guns. The sheer brutality sent shockwaves across the nation. Despite the public outcry condemning the massacre, its repercussions ironically impacted Capone negatively. Public sentiment shifted against him, and authorities redoubled their efforts to bring him down. Although he managed to escape conviction for the massacre itself, Capone ultimately faced charges of tax evasion leading to his eventual imprisonment yeah prohibition was something back then liquor was very valuable especially to a mobster did you know that valentine's day is named after a saint saint valentine he lived so long ago and there's so little actual historical facts about his life but i want to share with you something that really might be true and might be the reason why valentine's day is about love he lived in the Roman Empire in the 3rd century when it was illegal to be a Christian and the emperor did not allow the soldiers to get married. So the story goes that St. Valentine, who was either a priest or a bishop, would secretly administer the sacrament of holy matrimony to these couples who wanted to receive the grace of the sacrament so that God blesses their marriage. And so eventually he was martyred, he was killed, he risked his life so that he can give couples the sacrament of holy matrimony. Like I said, we're not exactly sure historically that this is the reason why Valentine's Day is about love, but one thing we do know for sure and I want to share on this Valentine's Day is that Jesus says that marriage is the unity of a man and a woman that God brings about. He says the two become one. Let's pray for purity and holiness in all marriages. Valentine's Day is up for debate on whether or not it's a fun holiday, but I can confirm the origin of it is a little dark and also quite interesting. It's named after one of the many St. Valentines. But origins are from the Roman festival of Lupercalia. Unlike Valentine's Day, however, Lupercalia was a bloody, violent, and sexually charged celebration awash with animal sacrifice, random matchmaking and coupling in hopes of warning off evil spirits and infertility. They chose names from a jar and were coupled together for the festival, kind of like the Hunger Games, I guess. They would use skin from sacrificed goats to whip any woman within reach, thought to bring about fertility and make birth easier for them. Pope Gelasius renamed the festival Valentine's Day at the end of the 5th century. Century. Now, on to the saints. One legend says that St. Valentine refused to convert to paganism, so he was executed by the Roman Emperor Claudius II. Before he was executed, he was able to miraculously heal his jailer's daughter of blindness, so the jailer and his family converted to Christianity. Another legend has St. Valentine as a priest, secretly marrying soldiers who were forbidden by the Emperor's rule, as he felt married soldiers were less effective. He wore a ring with Cupid on it, so they could identify him, a symbol of love. He also handed out paper hearts to remind Christians of their love for God, which is how he became known as the patron saint of love it's pretty interesting you know when it comes to how many different saint valentines there were but this uh but this looper kelly is something totally you know it's like there's so many levels and depths to this time of year what do you think of looper kelly let me know in the comments down below what are some pagan traditions that Christians still practice today? The Lord's Supper, where the cults of Mithras and Dionysus would eat bread and drink wine as a sacrament. Number two, the amazing goddess Nike. While many Christians do not believe that they practice worshiping false idols, I think that the God of the Bible might have a different point of view of that considering that they wear it all over their body. 
Number three, St. Valentine's Day coincides with the Festival of the Lupercalia in Rome or for the God of Pan in Greece. The celebration was from the 13th to the 15th and it promoted health and fertility. Number four, the cross or the Ankh or the Cairo. Well, anyway, Constantine saw it in a vision. Now this ancient hieroglyph meaning life or the key to the Nile is worn around people's necks as a reminder of a torture device. Overpriced chocolate, dinner, and a movie? No, baby. We celebrate Lupercalia. Lupercalia falls on February 15th and is an ancient pagan holiday of purification and fertility. The festival was held in ancient Rome, and the male priests would make animal sacrifices. They would sacrifice goats and cut the animal skin into strips and run around the streets with it naked. Any woman who came near them would be slapped with this animal skin to render them more fertile. Eventually, the Christian church caught wind of this and forbid participating in the festival. And so the holiday was changed to St. Valentine's. So if you want to celebrate this festival on the 15th, here are some ways that you can start. Tip one, have a feast. Make or order a lavish meal for you and your friends. Try to include foods that symbolize fertility as well. The pomegranate is one of them. Tip two, strut around the house naked or in lingerie. If you do choose to wear any lingerie, Red is the perfect color because it symbolizes lust, passion, and sexuality. Tip three, sex. Let yourself let loose, have fun, and be free, whether you're solo or part. Later on, after Rome adopted Christianity, and the Roman Empire fell, and the Holy Roman Empire began, the Roman Catholic Church made changes. The church was opposed to this display of open eroticism and sensuality that occurred during Lupercalia. In the 5th century, Pope Gelasius declared February 14th a holy day in honor of Valentinus instead of the pagan god Lupercus. As with most non-biblical customs found in the church today, Lupercalia was simply given a Christian sounding name and adopted into the universal Catholic Church. They adopted some of the pagan celebrations during Lupercalia to reflect Christian beliefs. For example, as part of the Juno Feberata ritual, instead of pulling girls' names from boxes, both boys and girls chose the names of martyred saints from a box. They were expected to emulate the life of the saint whose name they had drawn. And this is where we get Valentine's Day from. It was a rebranding of a pagan festival worshiping fertility. They did this to make it easy on the pagan converts who were coming into their new popular Christianity. These pagans were unwilling to give up their satanic pagan rituals. So instead of putting a halt to the growing paganism of the church, the Romans took the approach of blend and incorporate. But changing the name of a pagan ritual doesn't change the fact that it is still a pagan ritual. So this is where Valentine's Day comes from. It is completely pagan. During the Middle Ages, it began to be incorporated with love. And that's where much of what we know of it today comes from. But let's look at some of the symbols that are used today with Valentine's Day. The red rose. You think this flower was just chosen because it is beautiful? Not at all. Venus was the Roman goddess of beauty, love, fertility, and sexual immorality, such as prostitution. She was the Roman equivalent to the Greek goddess Aphrodite. Venus is the mother of Cupid. Her favorite flower was the red rose, which then associated the red rose with love. Because Valentine's Day became associated with love, in honor of the pagan goddess Venus, or Aphrodite, the goddess of love, red roses became synonymous with Valentine's Day. Just remember, if you look up most customs of today, you will often find a pagan god in connection with it. Does this mean it's pagan to love a red rose? Obviously not, but you should know why it is connected with Valentine's Day. Buying red roses for your loved one does not make you a pagan. I wanna make that clear. Cupid. Most people don't know this because he's often portrayed as a little baby boy, but Cupid is a pagan god. Like I said earlier, his mother was the goddess Venus. He is the counterpart of the Greek god Eros. According to the myth, Cupid was the son of Mercury and Venus, Mercury being the winged messenger of the gods, and Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. Cupid often appeared as a winged infant carrying a bow 
and a quiver of arrows. Legend has it that Cupid shoots magical gold tip arrows at both gods and humans. Yeah, that's pretty interesting stuff. So many renditions, it bleeds into mythology and shit. Mercury, Venus. Interesting. Let's discover the pagan origins of Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day as we know it now originally comes from the pagan Roman festival Lupercalia, also known as Deus Februatus, which means the purification. At this festival, pagans worship the god Lupercus, who is the protector of farmers and the god of fertility, of livestock. He held to Lupa the she-wolf, watch over Romulus and Remus inside the cave called the Lupercal. At this festival, which began inside the Lupercal, people sacrificed goats and young dogs, believing that in exchange their livestock would be fertile. Now, after the sacrifices, two young men would be brought to that vat of animal blood, where they would dip a sword in, touch to their forehead, and then they were supposed to burst out laughing. Totally normal holiday traditions. Besides getting wasted on wine and gorging themselves on food, young men would get naked and drape fresh animal skins over themselves and worship Lupercus, while whacking people passing by with strips of fresh animal skin. This somehow made women believe that swatting themselves with strips of fresh animal skin would make them fertile. But Valentine's Day became official sometime in the 5th century under Pope Galatius I. He hated pagans and Lupercalia and announced that St. Valentine's Day would be on February 14th the day before Lupercalia. The Catholic Church recognizes three different saints named Valentinus, all of whom were martyred. To hear more about them, follow me from a next video. Could you imagine living in that time period? Could you imagine celebrating Lupercalia back when Lupercalia was celebrated? Let me know in the comments down below. The locations of Chicago mob hits part two. Let's go. First up, we have the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. This occurred at 2122 North Clark Street. In 1929, El Capone sent a group of hitmen to take out members of the Moran Gang. They lined up seven of them against the wall and shot them all. Next up, we have Michael Cagnoni. He was an associate of the mob and a businessman. As his car passed the Cypress Restaurant in Hinsdale, and he was entering the southbound ramp to enter 294, a remote-controlled device detonated a bomb in his car killing him instantly. Next up, we have the Diane Masters hit. In 1982, corrupt cop and outfit associate Michael Corbett killed her and stuffed her in the trunk of her car. He then drove it into the sanitary and ship canal in Willow Springs. Next up, we have the hit of Mad Sam De Stefano. In 1973, it is believed his brother, Mario, and Tony Spilatro were set to meet him at his house, 1656 North Sayre. When Mario walked up and stepped aside, Tony Spilaccio was standing there with a the shotgun, and he took Sam out. And that's a wrap. Hope you enjoyed tonight's rabbit hole. And if you haven't already, please take a second just to smash that like. Subscribe. Ring that notification bell. Just to make sure the algorithm know what's up. So what are we going to do, y'all? That's right run these numbers up. Thanks again. Until next time.